thank you. Um, thanks very much for inviting me, and, and thank you all for coming. Um, it's, it was so nice coming in and hearing all the 60s music, so <laughs> I'm not sure we should spend too long on academic activities. I just want to dance. Let's get musical. Um, this has given me an opportunity to dabble in a bit of history. And whilst I'm really pleased that I was initially schooled in sociology and women's studies, I have a, a kind of secret desire to be a historian in a, another life, maybe. Um, but I'm, I'm very aware that we do have a historian present, so I'm a, an interloper here um, in this field. Um, in the abstract, I did talk about using Sarah Ahmed's work um, on emotionality of texts. And I'm afraid my dabbling in historical sources um, meant that that's where I got stuck. So I'm not using Ahmed today and haven't got that far. So I'm sorry for those of you who um, wanted that, but I'm focusing very much on um, a genealogy of the, women, of the woman student. So let me just get my watch out so I know what the time is. I realize there's no clock around. So just briefly, initially, um, the woman student then and now, 1963 and 2013. Um, so in 1963, just 31 universities, now 129. So dramatic expansion of the higher education sector. And of course that excludes all the privately funded higher education institutions that are at the moment causing a drain on the higher education budget for public higher education in this country. So, at the time of Robbins, about <coughs> a quarter of students in British universities were women. Um, in this academic year, last academic year, 55% of accepted applicants for undergraduate degrees were women. So again, a dramatic change. It's worth noting, though, that at the time of Robbins, many women were doing things like teacher training, which at the time, of course, was not part of a university, it wasn't a degree, similarly with nursing. So um, about two-thirds of the students in, in training colleges for teaching were women. So obviously that means that the proportion of women doing what we would consider now to be higher education was actually um, higher than this appears. But the numbers did vary by institution, and there you can see just 10% at Cambridge and 15% at Oxford um, in 1963. Um, and now Cambridge under 50% and Oxford just over 50%. But of course that's still below the average across the country as a whole, and many institutions like my own um, have a far higher proportion of women students. And I will, I'll come back to Sussex a little bit later. So there's also been um, subject stratification. And you can see, I mean, these figures aren't directly comparable, um, but very similar kinds of patterns. So Robbins reports that 66% of women with two A-level passes took only arts subjects in 1960 to 61, and 26% took science only. Um, and then for this year, we have the proportion of women doing English A-level um, compared to the numbers doing, or the proportions of all <coughs> students doing physics. So again, we can see a very similar um, trend. In fact, there do seem to be some suggestions that this kind of subject division has become more entrenched um, at GCSE and A-level schools recently. Um, but I haven't looked at those figures in, in any great detail. So, some signs of change, progress, um, but some, whoops, can't be bad. Um, some um, very clear similarities. And this is a theme that runs through um, this analysis. Now, as feminists, we're all too aware that progress isn't simply a nice, neat, um, linear move from unenlightened to enlightenment times. Um, so for this analysis, I'm influenced by Foucault, uh, Foucault's um, kind of approach to a genealogical method, um, one aspect of which is to problematize precisely that linear progression idea. So just a little bit then on genealogy. Um, 
So there's this notion of a history of the present, that we start with the problems and issues of today and then look backwards from today. So the issue is using history to try and inform um, our understanding of today. To focus on specific localised events in context rather than trying to trace origins or anything like that. So to look at specific situations. And it emphasises discontinuities, interruptions and recurrences rather than this idea of a continuous um, progressive development. And Foucault talks about subjugated knowledges by which he's talking about um, popular knowledges, dis disqualified or illegitimate knowledges. So of course any challenge to or questioning of traditional gender relations may well fit within such a, a definition. Um, he suggests that subjugated knowledges were concerned with a historical knowledge of struggles. Um, and again, the feminist um, project um, in some ways fits with that. So let us use the term genealogy to the union of erudite knowledges and local memories, which allows us to establish a historical knowledge of the struggles and to make use of this knowledge tactically today. Now, in terms of, of methodology, what I've done was, as I say, I kind of dived in historical sources and took great pleasure from reading lots of stuff from the 1960s. Now, in 1963, I was nine years old, so I wasn't at the point of, of going to university. It was 10 years before um, I began my own um, undergraduate studies. Um, but I do, it does evoke lots of memories for me of the 60s. I do remember um, being a child at that time um, I had a sister, have a sister, who's 12 years older than me. Um, so I kind of was quite influenced in kind of popular culture and so on from her at the time as well. Um, so I spent quite a lot of time delving into these archives. Um, the sources I've looked at are the Robbins Report itself, debates in the House of Commons and the House of Lords around the time that Robbins was presented to Parliament, um, at which there's pages and pages of um, debate. I did a search of, of national newspapers um, published in 1963 and 1974, particularly looking for stuff around women and students, um, and women and universities, those kinds of searches. And I looked at the Beaver, which is the student union magazine for the LSE. And the reason I chose the Beaver is, well, I've kind of looked at the Beaver before, and it's very easily accessible, and I could do it from my PC, which um, made life um, much easier. And, of course, it's, it goes back to that time and is still being published um, today. And so I've tried to identify themes within these various source, sources to look at the way women students were talked about and were positioned um, in these various contexts. So, Maria Tambuku argues that the feminist project of recovering women's presence in history seems to be in line with the genealogical interest in peripheral histories and subjugated knowledges. So again, it seems to, to fit um, with um, the topic, I suppose, of what we're looking at today. So moving on to the co Robbins Committee report. Now, anyone who's looked, looked into Robbins will have seen the stuff on the aims um, of higher education. Robbins put the instruction in skills suitable to play a part in the general division of labour as the first aim, but actually said that didn't indicate any prioritising of that aim. It wasn't that that aim was more important, it was that that was the aim that didn't get talked about of higher education. Now, I'm not sure that applies today. Um, certainly within public policy, that's probably the main thing that's, that's talked about. Um, today. Um, and there's things in there about producing cultivated men and women um, and the transmission of a common culture. And again, it raises questions around cultural capital, whose culture, what culture, um, what do we mean by cultivated in that particular context, um, and white middle class masculinist culture was very much the culture of higher education at the time, but of course that isn't problematised. Um, in this context. 
<coughs> Robbins recommended significant expansion of the higher education sector um, and predicted, I mean, there, were all, there was already increasing demand for HE, but predicted far greater demand. Um, one of the things that he noted was that equal opportunities activities in schools were likely to result in greater demand from higher education um, on the part of, of young people. But this expansion had taken place or had begun before Robbins, so there'd already been a deci decision to um, set up seven new universities, of which Sussex was one, prior to um, Robbins, uh, the Robbins report itself. Robin stressed that higher education should be open with up to all those with the qualifications and willingness to pursue it. So, how do women's feature in Robin's? Well, Louise has already suggested that there was a separate heading, Women in Higher Education, um, which is actually one paragraph in the Robin's report. Um, and that talks about the, the kind of proportion of women and so on in higher education. <coughs> now, women are talked about elsewhere in the Robbins report without that heading. So there's another heading about adult education, much of which is about married women. And again, I'll come back to that. So women do feature various, in various places of the report. Um, but there is no heading men in higher education. And when you look at the index at the back, Women students features as a topic in the index, and there's quite a few page numbers. And then at the bottom of that, it says, see also students. <laughs> and then you go to students, and of course, under that, there's no men students either. Um, so students are men, and then we have a special category of women students. And that's very clear um, throughout the report. Actually, I also came across a study um, conducted by a sociologist, Ferdinand Zweig, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his name right, Z-W-E-I-G, um, who'd done a, a survey of um, students in Oxford and Manchester um, around the time. And, of course, more of the students were men, but he kind of explains that mostly his kind of random sample was fairly representative of the population of those particular universities. Um, and where it deviated from that sample, it was deliberate. And one way it deviated was that there were far less women in his sample than there were in the universities themselves. And he explained that that was deliberate because women aren't going to go on to, uh, go on to be leaders of their communities. So actually, he only surveyed a few women. It's very clear that part of, of the um, zeitgeist, I suppose, part of the culture, at the time. So, Robbins does talk about untapped talent. Um, a lot of what he's talking about is about class, um, but he also includes women um, in that. And he notes changes in professional requirement for the occupations that are open to girls. May mean that in future they need to do higher education courses. So I'd recognise that changes in the labour market um, may um, influence the proportion of women going to HE. And he also both noted and recommended new curricular developments in higher education. Now he's talking about language courses, which may prove particularly attractive to girls. Um, but also spoke about the value of a broad curricula, um, which he was recommending and suggested again that that might prove more attractive to girls um, than to boys to encourage more girls to go to higher education. And then, and this is within the, the adult education bit, the important, sorry, am I sitting in front of you? Is that better? No, that's fine. <laughs> um, the importance of updated, um, updating or refresher courses for married women, along with adequate financial arrangements. Um, now, before Robbins, in 1960, the Anderson Committee had recommended grants for full-time students. So actually, that was one of the things that, that made a real difference in terms of, um, I suppose, what we would now call widening participation, and in terms of access to higher education. Um, that students were able to get their fees paid and to get means-tested grants based on 
parental income. Um, and Robbins was suggesting that financial support needed to be open to married women for whom returning to study may have particular financial implications. And also he acknowledged older women who may not have done a, a first degree at all and to return to study. So in some ways, there was a lifelong learning agenda there as well in Robbins. So married women, and this is very long, I don't expect to read it all. Basically what he was saying was that there's a new career path. A short period of work before marriage, and then a second period of work starting perhaps 15 years later. So when women had had children, and then they would return to work. And he talks about the problem of early marriage, which leads girls capable of going to higher education or into the professions to leave school before they enter the sixth form and in some cases, after the sixth form, um, rather than going to higher education. So there's a really, um, not only in Robbins, but also in the debates in Parliament at the time, mostly when women students are talked about, it's in relation to marriage, um, and married women and the problem of early marriage. But I'll, I'll come back to that. Just briefly to deviate on academic staff um, in Robbins, it's just totally clear that it's men that are assumed. Yeah, there is no space for women to be academic staff in the Robbins report. Now, we might think, well, that's partly because of the generic use of he, um, which was um, ubiquitous at the time. People weren't questioning. Or, or certainly it wasn't having any impact if they were, um, that generic use of, of he to mean both he and she. Um, but it goes further than that, it's not only that. So here we have the young scientist needs time to press ahead with his research when his imagination is at its liveliest. His colleagues in the arts may be better occupied in wide reading than in research on particular problems and he may well need more time free from teaching when his crop is ready for harvesting <laughs> in middle life. I mean, the language is it's just fascinating in itself. And here we have the fact that the colleges own many houses, and this was to do with issues around accommodation. Um, the fact that the colleges own many houses in the near neighbourhood make it possible for a non-resident tutor to dine in college and be available outside office hours without feeling he's neglecting his wife and family. And he can entertain his students without imposing undue burdens on his wife. Now, we didn't have gay marriage at that point. There is no way this could have been a woman. Yeah. So um, there, there's no space for, for academic women within Robbins. It is possible that women could be technicians. Um, we do have men and women talked about in relation to technicians, but not in relation um, to academics. So, Robbins did come at a time when higher education was expanded and furthered that expansion and actually um, re recommended very significant expansion with a lot of financial implications to that as well. So this was seen as quite dramatic. So we have the decade of the degree. The 60s in Britain were the decade of the degree. At the end of it, there were twice as many students as at the beginning. In the last 10 years, whether in industry, in administration, or even in the city and the army, the BA or MA has become the password to promotion and a main instrument of social change, the most important rung in the ladder of self-improvement. Now, the increased credentialism, then, that we see now was evident in the 1960s as well. Uh, it's gone rather more rampant um, in recent years. Blackburn and Jarman, who were writing in 1993, suggest that from 1960, both the Anderson, which recommended the full grants, and Robin's recommendations resulted in a decline in inequalities. So, um, widening participation effectively um, improved. But inequalities widened again to 1980, a supply failed to keep up with demand, and in a comp competitive context, the middle classes managed to maintain their advantage. Um, so it didn't, it's, again, it's not a simple linear pattern. 
um, of improvement for working class students. But despite this decline in inequalities in terms of class, the proportion of women in higher education didn't noticeably increase during the 1960s. It certainly wasn't the decade of the degree for women. Yes, more women in terms of numbers of women going to higher education increased. More women went, but far more men went as well. So men were more likely to take up the extra places than women were. So the proportions of women in comparison to men um, didn't improve during the 1960s. And Carol Diehouse notes that the proportion of women in HE in the late 1960s was actually not very different from the mid-1920s. So again, we've got a very kind of static, and she's got a nice little graph um, that shows that. Um, and Blackburn and Jarman again um, say that actually during the period of rapid expansion following the Robbins report, women actually lost ground to men. Now they suggest that this may have to do, have been to do with the fact that women needed time to get used to the fact that they could go to higher education, um, <coughs> whereas men could take it for granted far more. And that schools that advised girls and boys would still be advising boys and hadn't quite cottoned on that they could advise girls to go to <coughs> higher education as well. It was only from 1970 um, that the gender gap begins to narrow. Um, this is, again, Blackwood and Jarman. Um, and more women begin to go. And they suggest this is a kind of cumulative effect. So as more women go, so more women think they can go, and so on. But of course, um, from the 1970s, we've also got lots of talk about equal opportunities, we've got the women's movement, and so on, so lots of different influences. Which suggests that perhaps the women's movement was as beneficial um, or influential in relation to women going to higher education um, as Robbins, and perhaps even more so. Um, obviously the Anderson report and the grants made a big difference there as well. <coughs> so <coughs> I then started to think about what are the dominant constructions of the woman student um, in Robbins' time. And basically it was women as reproductive and heterosexual bodies it seems to come over very, very strongly. So in Robins, women, well, they're either girls and schoolgirls, um, or they're, and often they're girls threatened with marriage, actually, so they're still girls. Um, but very much it's defined by marriage and the early marriage problem. Um, and women as sexualized and particularly heterosexualized. <coughs> and that sexuality is both objects of heterosexual desire, but also dangerous sexuality um, as well. So, the early <coughs> marriage problem. So, Ola Renshaw, who was, I think, principal of the Association of Public Girls' Schools, or something like that at the time, Valerie's nodding, obviously got it, some, something like that. Um, so, she described marriage for women today as a hazard, as far as university education is concerned, almost in the category of war service. And Dye House also um, notes Lady Ogilvie's um, report to, or submission to the Robbins report, and she was the principal of St. Anne's, St. Anne's College, Oxford, um, who said that marriage amongst undergraduates was a grave error and should be deterred by threats to withdraw grants. <laughs> but as Dye House notes, marriage for women was a way of gaining an income after graduation. So, on one level, you could see why women were interested in marriage as a way of being supported, because the graduate opportunities open to women um, were far less than those open to men. But the views of Ola Renshaw and, and Ogil, Ogilvy, struggled to say that, on the dangers of marriage weren't supported by all students. And there was an article in The Guardian in um, October 1963 um, with the heading Students' Union by Richard Bourne, um, a girl postgraduate. Um, and the account was about a girl postgraduate um, who was actually married to a union official. 
and she was reported as saying, it's much better to be married than to want to be and stay single until after you've got a degree. That waiting is a tremendous strain. Why wait when you're 22 and you know that so many other girls of your age are married? And a lecturer also said that married students do extraordinarily well. Marriage seems to settle them. It's the love life when they're single that is so devastating. This is a woman lecturer um, who is um, quoted in the article as well. Now the article points out that there's no data at the time on the number of married students. Um, but in some places, including Oxford colleges, students have to ask permission to stay as undergraduates um, once they're married. Um, and the article ends with an account of a biology fellow at St John's College, um, Oxford, whose wife was an undergraduate reading English. And he, this um, biology fellow said, married men undergraduates work like maniacs academically and then he turns to talk about his own wife, who was turned down by St. Anne's when she said she planned to marry, but accepted at Somerville. And he said, I think it helped her being married, this is. Otherwise, she would have been wondering whether there was a young man coming along. And to have a home can be a very cheerful thing when you're harassed by work. No <laughs> doubt to have a home to be a housewife to look after them is uh, what was reassured here. So, alongside this positioning of students as little more than marriage material, there was also this idea of, of women's um, dangerous sexuality. And there's quite a lot in the literature about the surveillance of women's sexual behaviour, um, which was more stringent than that of men in the colleges, in the universities. Um, here's Sheila Rowbottom remembering her time in Oxford. Not only did the Oxford regime induce hypocrisy and fear, it was also manifestly unfair. The penalties were faced in the women's colleges were much more severe than those governing male sexuality. Um, and I certainly remember the college I went to in 1976 to do my PGC um, actually had very strict rules about, for those who were living in college, I wasn't fortunately, um, but very strict rules about being out after hours and having men in rooms and, and all of this kind of stuff. Um, and a lot of feeling that some of this was still very prevalent <coughs> at that time in the mid-70s as well. Um, there was a lot of fear of pregnancy and abortion. Um, and these two newspaper articles um, indicate that. Um, the first one... On the, the one on the right, Cherwell exposes the frightened girls of Oxford, um, was from November 1963 from the Daily Express. And it was about the number of women having illegal abortions um, at Oxford. Um, and then um, the baby or degree girls of Ward is a report effectively on the same story from the, the Beaver, the NSE student magazine of the time. Pregnancy outside marriage was not condoned, and in some colleges, marriage for women wasn't condoned. Um, and for women, and the, the, again, reports in the literature of women saying, well, I actually wanted to have a baby, um, but if I did that, I couldn't have finished my degree, so um, it's one or the other. Um, and then a whole debate in the press with Oxford saying, no, we don't ban girls who are pregnant, and, and so on. And then this is from the Beaver in 1964, in February. And this is a young woman um, talking about fitting in. I wanted to be a popular person around the school. I got used to blue jokes. I wasn't exactly displeased after a while when people made personal remarks about my figure. This seemed to make me universally considered fair game. I was constantly bombarded with invitations to go to bed. Now this was in the context, as I say, of a, um, an article that had the headline Undergrad Morals 64, in February 64. Um, and the discussion is around the LSE having no halls of residence for women, 
So women were predominantly in lodgings um, and therefore often isolated. Um, and even in the third year, many girls feel that they failed to come to terms with the environment. Um, and this girl is quoted about the pressures of trying to fit in and the pressures of fitting in. So again, it's all about um, women fitting in um, to a sexist and highly sexualized culture, um, which they're expected to tolerate. But Dye House points out that the Dolly Bird image was actually used to sell universities, and that this was particularly important for the new universities of the 1960s, who were seen as attractive to women who didn't have the baggage and history of um, sex discrimination. Quite a lot of women felt there was no point applying to Oxbridge because there was, they took so few women um, and were looking for somewhere else, um, where a broader curriculum was seen as appealing, and so on. Um, so Dye House argues that the Dolly Bird was effectively part of the branding image of the new universities. And so we come to the University of Sussex. Um, and here is Samson again from 1971. Sussex soon enjoyed special publicity as a kind of glamorous Brighton finishing school, full of pretty girls and avant-garde intellectuals. Note the dichotomy between the two. <laughs> Um, the pretty girls aren't intellectuals, that's for sure. Um, and Ola Renshaw, um, again, um, explained that the new universities near to London proved particularly popular um, for women because of the easy access to get to London, for its theatres, for its art, and, and so on. And she says, Sussex University has proved so attractive to women that there has to be discriminatory selection in the arts subjects to prevent the student population from becoming predominantly female. In consequence, the academic ability of women students at Sussex is said to be on average above that of men. <laughs> as it was at Oxford as well, actually, at the time. Um, there were far more women with three A levels with marks of 60% and above at Oxford than there were men. So women had to be better um, to get accepted onto places. Um, I think it's interesting that um, although in the last decade or so we've had lots of panics and um, so on about women taking over the universities, there was evidence of it here um, way back in the 60s. Um, men, in contrast, tended to prioritise the older universities. But back to women students as, as um, heterosexual bodies. Um, I also looked at the newspapers at the time, and the Beaver, the LSE student newspaper, proved fairly fruitful. So a few images from the Beaver. Um, this is actually a story about a union officer, although you wouldn't really know that from the beginning. Um, pretty vivacious Meg Atkinson. Um, the, whole story, the whole article is about how she's the social VP, she's responsible for organising the commemorative ball, and she says her hard work is going to mean it's the best fall ever. Um, but that's not, as you can see, the, the way in which this particular article is presented. And of course, it's the decade of the beauty contest. So the first one, guess which one, was the Beaver in October 1963. Um, and Miss Beaver 64 was November 1964. Um, again very much like front page covers of the Student Union <coughs> magazine and not in any way problematised at the time. And another front page cover. This is the dusky LSE girls. And this, um, the story is about a beauty contest um, specifically for coloured girls is the language of the time. Um, and again, all of this unproblematised. So it comes as quite of a shock to kind of go back to that and suddenly think, hang on, what, what was happening around that time? Now at the same time, and also reported in the pages of the Beaver, um, there was a very active um, LSE Society Against Racial Discrimination that was active in anti-apartheid movements and that was actually organising a picket at the time um, 
which took place in November 1963, at the Whiskey A Go Go Club, um, because in October, um, two coloured students, as the language was, two black students, had attempted to gain membership to Whiskey A Go Go and had been refused and were told that there were no more memberships available. Immediately before those two students had gone to get access, and immediately afterwards, white students had gone and had been given membership without any problem. So this got reported in the student union newspaper and a picket was established in November um, and then in a later issue, later November I think, um, of the magazine, there was a letter from the manager of Whiskey A Go Go saying we do not operate a colour bar. Um, and vowing that that wasn't what was going on. But of course this was a time when colour bars, as they were called, were very evident. And it was possible for people to um, advertise who they didn't want in their lodgings and so on. And the Beaver again also points out that in the LSE lodgings questionnaire that was sent to landladies, there had been a list of races whereby landladies could tick the ones that they wouldn't accept as lodgers in their, um, in their accommodation. As a result of the LSE campaign, they got the, the university to change its lodgings questionnaire to make landladies, and it was always landladies, this was the language, landladies write in the races that they wouldn't accept. And as a result of that change, there were fewer landladies who actually put racial criteria as a, a reason for um, not accepting students. So, a, a very, I mean, a very, very different time. Clearly, the union was actually, uh, <coughs> and people in the union students were trying to take action on some um, issues of racism around at the time. Um, but there was not a lot of evidence of intersectionality um, in some ways from looking at these. And there's just another front cover of the book. <coughs> so the main images, the main story are all the candidates for the president, all nice men, and at the bottom, but she's a winner. Um, again, women being used in this particular <coughs> way as an equity um, of the magazine. And there we have an article which is actually about an LSE researcher in accountancy, believe it or not, um, who's <coughs> studying the effects of electronic computers, this was fairly early on, in the history of computing, on accounting theory and accounting practice. Um, but again, um, the um, image um, is rather irrelevant to that, you might say. And then a few job adverts from the Beaver. Now, of course, at the time, job adverts could be advertised for men with no assumption that women would go for them. So both these adver advertisements refer to the men that they want um, in those jobs. Um, this was way before the Sex Discrimination Act, that wasn't until 1975, so um, this was quite possible at the time, and of course one reason why there were few, relatively few graduate openings for women students. And then this one beats the lot, I think. About five foot six blonde and blue eyes, and this is, um, I'm not sure if it's very clear on there, but you could see it very clearly. Um, but this is someone who um, talks about, I'm lazy, I can watch my wife now, mow the lawn without a form of confidence, conscience, and so on. So the whole thing is, again, aimed at men. Um, and it is a job advert, believe it or not. So, women's bodies predominantly reproductive and sexualized. And yes, there is stuff in Robbins about women's untapped academic ability. And Robbins certainly makes clear that women are as able as men to go to higher education. Um, but still, that comes second to this idea of marriage and reproduction. So the social expectation of early marriage, social mores against pregnancy outside marriage, and the illegality of abortion are all part of the social context of the early 1960s. 
and women students who were often leaving home to go to university were seen to be at particular risk. <coughs> but let's move on a bit to the present. And I just took a few snapshots of um, university websites. Um, picked a bit at random, but partially purposefully. This was where I did my undergraduate degree, although at the time it was called Teesside Polytechnic. <coughs> um, but a very typical image on the front. Congratulations to our graduates, and they're all women um, graduates, happy, smiling, and so on. So women as academically able and successful. Um, but also, as Barbara Reed and I found um, in our book on gender and the changing face of higher education, when we looked at a number of university websites, um, women are usually conventionally attractive, happy, smiling all the time, young, um, long hair, blonde was very common, predominantly white, and so on. Um, and um, that's still very evident. That's my current university website, London Met. Um, a bit more diverse in terms of the images um, and slightly more stupid women than men, but predominantly young women again. Um, I looked at Cambridge just because I wanted to look at an Oxbridge um, website. This actually wasn't the front page, and it's something that Barbara and I noticed. The front pages of elite university websites never have students on them. They have um, classic looking buildings, or in this case for Cambridge, it was a library, art, and um, books, um, or something like that. Um, so I had to go through to the link to undergraduate students, and then came across this image. And we have University of Sussex. Um, again, lots of students, lots of women. So women have made it into the academy, and so much so, we're now a threat. Um, so white males now classed as a minority group at university was from August last year. Um, and UCAS Chiefs warns over worrying university gender gap was just last month. And not only are women students successful, but they've even taken over from men, including in bastions of, of masculine kind of predominance in the past. So here, the first one, male online, was from last year. Girls are basically taking boys' places. Um, and again last year, the girls outperforming boys in masculine subjects. So even on their own territory now, um, women are taking over from men. So on one level, women students now seen as academic, as minds as well as bodies. Although, as I've noted elsewhere, this is there are serious limitations to this. Um, but women um, as heterosexualized bodies continues. Um, this was the Southampton University Union poster in 2010, um, which was to promote an event for Women's Day um, featuring bikini clad women. Um, references such as Here Come the Girls. Um, and there was, as you can imagine, quite a fuss about this. Um, and they then produced one for Men's Day, um, which is about manning up. Um, so our students' unions are not always um, progressive, as our universities are not always progressive either. Now there's lots of other um, examples. Um, this was um, the Lion the student newspaper of Haythrop College, University of, of London. Um, and the headline, this week are ans agony uncles answer your questions on fornicating with faculty, keeping your girl in check and dealing with less attractive females. <laughs> and this um, has recently um, been circulating, and people may have seen this. This is a video um, which was filmed on the top deck of a bus, and it was Sterling um, University men's hockey team, and they're shouting or chanting a sort of song which is incredibly effects, offensive and abusive um, to women. Um, and you see other students, men as well as women, looking uncomfortable but not 
tackling it. It's one woman's voice you hear um, trying to, to tackle it and, and argue against it. And of course we've got the Everyday Sexism <coughs> Twitter feed and a website with lots of stuff around what's happening in universities. <coughs> Alison Phipps' work here at, at Sussex, the NUS Hidden Marks survey, all show the levels of sexism, misogyny and abuse that women students face. Um, which again reflects the context and culture in which we live. And we also have continued debate about beauty contests. Um, this was actually from Mail Online, it was headlined Freely Feminists, and it was about women students fighting for the right to be in beauty contests. Um, and this was actually from a few years ago, 2008. So lots of contestation um, around how women, um, women's bodies um, are used and, and evident. So, to draw this to a close, um, a genealogical approach takes the present and the problems of the present as its starting point. And where we still have women students constructed in terms of their sexuality, sexual harassment, and crime, and so on, it seems that we still have particular problems about the place of women in higher education. Note at the time of Robbins, the term sexual harassment was not in play. It was, I think, the late 1970s in America before we had um, research and publications around sexual harassment at work, for example, and the, the National Organization of Women in the States who began to take action on that. So um, the night, that was way after um, the 1970s. Drawing on the work of McCullum, Mead Moore et al, um, note that historical data are used to unsettle and destabilize the self-evidence of the conceptual bedrock of present understanding and analyses. And I'm wondering how looking back to the 60s does that. It seems to me looking at both raises so many questions. Um, around gender relations and certainly problematizes ideas of a nice um, linear progress. But there have been some things that are better and some things definitely are better for women um, than they were in the 60s. Um, so to what extent does looking back to the 60s help us to understand um, the subjectivity of the woman student today? And does it enable us, in Foucault's terms, um, to make use of this knowledge tactically um, as part of feminist activity? I mean, what it does, looking back, it shows us the different ways in which women are marginalised and othered. It helps us to see what has changed and where some progress has taken place. Um, but also, it illustrates the persistence of misogyny. Um, and the power of the production of heterosexualized subjectivities. But it also demonstrates that we're not <coughs> passive dupes in this, either in the face of discursive power or misogynistic oppression. So, as Tambuco argues in relation to her own genealogy of the feminist subject in education, within the spaces of these contested sites, written by contradictions and uncertainties, the technologies women use to map their existence would be a nexus of resistance and accommodation practices inextricably woven. And she suggests that through these technologies of resistance, women begin to fashion new forms of subjectivity. So, I'll leave you with a question. What does this genealogy tell us that we can make use of as feminists in the academy?